Greetings AP Calc BC students, Mr. Record here. We're going to take a look at our example two from topic 9.6. We're still amidst all of our motion along of the curve problems and our example two is going to look a little bit like the example one except everything is going to be all consolidated together in one question. Let's take a look. So here we go. The directions say sketch the path of an object that moves along this plane curve given by R of t equal t squared minus 3i plus tj. We're going to find the velocity and acceleration vectors at and speed at time 0 and time 2. And we're going to sketch these velocity and acceleration vectors on the curve. So one of the first things that we're going to have to do before we even consider what the sketch of the velocity and acceleration vectors are going to look like is we do have to sketch this curve. So I'm going to go ahead and take care of that first. And there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, one way that I advocate in problems where we have a pretty simple vector function is to set up your table of values. So you have an x column, a y column, and a, a t column, of course. Now, you're not limited to doing that. You could try to uh, present this as a rectangular equation. I don't think it would be terribly difficult to do, but by the time you get that rectangular equation, you're probably going to have to set up a t-chart for the xy, and you might as well do your t-chart right here at the very beginning. Um, in instances where you have like sines and cosines there, like we did in example one, those seem to be exceptions to this kind of a problem. So we're going to go ahead and let t be it's just some various values. There's really no rhyme or reason to what I'm choosing for t here. Just judging by the size of this coordinate plane, I'm thinking in, in, in my head that if we span our t's between negative 3 and positive 3, it's likely going to spit out enough results that most of which should fit within our coordinate plane. But if any of these don't fit, we just ignore them. And if we feel like we need more, we can try to expand our selections of t outside of negative 4 and 4. You're always welcome to plug in fractional values of t, but I would only do that if it was absolutely necessary. So when we plug negative 3 in for the x component, which is exactly what we have here, we're going to plug negative 3 in for t in the x component. And we have negative 3 squared minus 3, which is 9 minus 3, which is 6. Negative 2 squared minus 3 is 4 minus 3. Negative 1 squared minus 3 is 1 minus 3. 0 minus 3, of course. And then we're kind of back to recreating what we did before. We have 1 minus 3, 4 minus 3, and 9 minus 3. Very symmetrical. Now. As far as the y component here is concerned, well, that's a pretty easy thing to deal with because y is equal to t, and therefore we can just replicate these guys. All right, so let's go ahead and start plotting this. So we uh, take the, the ordered pair 6, negative 3, which, oh, doggone it, that doesn't want to seem to fit, does it? So we just move to another point, 1, negative 2 down here negative 2, negative 1 would look like this. Negative 3, 0 is here. We have our negative 2, 1 here. 1, 2 is right here. And that 6, 3, well, 6, 3 would be up here, and 6, negative 3 would be down here if we could fit them. But it doesn't hurt to throw them in there to kind of get an idea about what direction that we would be headed. So I'm going to try to connect these dots and do so as artistically as possible to create something here that looks pretty good and nice and smooth. And it's not a secret that you've got yourself a sideways opening parabola, no doubt about it. Now, the only thing that we haven't uh, really discussed is the orientation. And we do need to look at the progression of these t values and see how the x, y values are changing. And as it turns out, if we look at this first point, 1, negative 2, when t is negative 2, and then we go to negative 2, negative 1, and etc., no doubt about it that the orientation of this graph would be as such. And you only are obligated to place one arrow that would pretty much communicate the orientation. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and put a few to make it quite obvious here. So we've got the sketch of the graph. We can now move on to our velocity vectors and acceleration vectors. So for the velocity vector, v, 
that is just the derivative of the position. Our position vector 2t, uh, t squared minus 3 is going to produce a 2t with our i unit vector. And then the derivative of t, of course, is 1, which would multiply by our j unit vector. At this point, we can go ahead and evaluate at time 0, and we'll evaluate at time 2 to get our two specific velocity vectors. When you replace t with 0, this entire i component goes away, and you're left with just j. And when we replace t with 2, we have 4i plus 1j. Let's go ahead and sketch those velocity vectors, and then we'll go on and do our acceleration vectors. So the first thing that you're going to have to do is determine where you are on the curve at time 0. And so that is going to occur when the ordered pair was at negative 3, 0. It's nice to have this table of values as a reference. So right about there seems to be a good spot to put our t equals 0. And the fact that this velocity vector is just 1 times j is indicating to us that there is no horizontal movement, but only vertical movement upward because it's positive and one unit long. And so we would have this as our vector evaluated at 0, straight up. Over at time 2, we can see that we're at the ordered pair 1, 2, which is right here. And at that particular instance, our velocity vector, 4i plus j, basically takes us out to where we want to go four units horizontally, but one unit vertically, and that would take us right to that point there. So if you're on this amusement park ride, as you're moving around, your body is going to want to tend to move straight up when you reach this point here, but of course the ride's going to whip you around, so that could be sort of an enjoyable experience if you're into those thrill rides. And then by the time you get here at time two, since the velocity vector sort of coincides with the curve a little bit, the thrill isn't quite as, as prolific, although the longer the vector is, obviously the faster you're traveling, and that could provide some enjoyment or fear or whatever the case may be. Let's go ahead and take a look at our acceleration vectors. Taking the derivative of velocity will indeed give us acceleration. So the derivative of 2t is 2. We'll multiply that by i. And then the derivative of 1j, well, that's just 0j, which means there is no j. So that makes for some very interesting acceleration vectors, right? When you replace the t with 0, of which there is no t, you're just going to get 2 times i. And when you replace your 2 in for your t, you still get 2 times i. So this acceleration vector is a constant vector. It's not a constant value, of course, because acceleration still has to be a vector. So we just simply draw a horizontal vector 2 units long from that point. And I'm going to do the same thing here. A2. And I noticed that I did not label my velocity vector at 2, so I'm going to do that. It's, it's really important that you do label your vectors, um, especially if you're drawing multiple ones. Um, I, I can tell my students that it's quite often on tests that I will give you a graph where you'll draw more than one vector. Um, using obviously different colors like I am is very helpful, but I don't expect you to do that. Um, and you can just basically accomplish the same thing by uh, very easily labeling them. Now there is another thing that we need to do here. We are supposed to figure out the speed. It's really the last thing that we have to do. And I never really have a, a variable abbreviation for speed. I just call it speed. And we know that speed is the apps as the square root, sorry, of the sum of the squares of the components for your velocity. So in other words, your speed is going to look something like that. And if we simplify this, we get the square root of 4t squared plus 1. And what's interesting about the speed is you can do all sorts of neat things with this. You could actually sketch the graph of speed, uh, which is just a function of speed versus time. 
but it would tell you some very interesting things about the maximum velocities and minimum velocities that are occurring on your curve or your amusement park ride. I have a really great skill builder question that's going to address that. But in this particular problem, we do not need to do that. We merely need to take that speed expression and evaluate it when time is zero, which is going to give us the square root of zero plus one, which of course is one. And then we're going to do the same thing, speed evaluated at time t equal two, which is the square root of four times four, which is 16 plus one and of course that's going to be the square root of 17. So you can see that you are traveling along this ride at different rates at different speeds depending on where the point is indeed located. Got a few more motion along curve problems coming up for you later. We want you to check those out. Each one's going to have just a little bit of a different twist to it. Next one up is going to require the use of a calculator. So we'll check that one out next time. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you.